Welcome to Radical AI, a podcast about technology, power, society, and what it means to be human in the age of information. We are your hosts, Dylan and Jess. We're two PhD students with different backgrounds researching AI and technology ethics. In this episode, we interview Meredith Broussard about her newly released book. It's titled More Than a Glitch, Confronting Race, Gender, and Ability Bias in Tech, published by MIT Press. Meredith is a data journalist, an associate professor at the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute of NYU, a research director at the NYU Alliance for Public Interest Technology, and the author of several books, including More Than a Glitch, which we cover in this episode, and Artificial Unintelligence, How Computers Misunderstand the World. Her academic research focuses on artificial intelligence in investigative reporting and ethical AI with a particular interest in using data analysis for social good. Also, for those of you who are looking to read this book and to buy this book, first of all, we highly recommend it. It's amazing. We literally speed read it over the course of like two, three days before this interview. Um, But second of all, we have a little surprise for you. So for the first time ever on this show, we have a special discount code for you to buy this book. And this was graciously provided by Meredith. So for listeners who have a mailing address in the United States, if you go to www.penguinrandomhouse.com, you can buy Meredith's book for 15% off if you use the code READMIT15 at the checkout. And that code is in all caps. Um, You can also find all of this information on the show notes page for this episode, which, by the way, if you were not aware, we have show notes for every single episode that we do on this show. And you can find them on our website at RadicalAI.org. On the show notes pages, we have things like discount codes to books now, and we also have relevant links that are um, brought up maybe during the interview or also just related to topics that we discuss during an interview and during an episode. And we also have a summary of the episode and a transcript where you can read the episode and other links to view the episode or to listen to the episode on platforms or view the episode. Actually, we also have a YouTube channel. (laughs) So um, yeah, all of this is available available for every single episode. And if you're wondering where to find this, if you go to our website, RadicalAI.org, on our homepage, you can scroll down on the homepage and there is one carousel for episodes with guests where we have just one guest that we interviewed. And then if you keep scrolling, there's a carousel for interviews that we've done with multiple guests as well. And you can just click on the image and it'll take you straight to the show notes page. All right, so now that I've waxed poetic about our website for long enough, we've kept you from this interview for far too long. Uh, So without further ado, we are so excited to share this interview with Meredith, with all of you. We are on the line today with Meredith Broussard to discuss her new book, More Than a Glitch, Confronting Race, Gender, and Ability Bias in Tech published by the MIT Press. And we are so excited to have Meredith. We've heard so many different things about the book, and now we've read it ourselves. And just, it's it's so good. It's so good. We won't spend the entire hour saying how good it is, but like, it's so good. Um, and so I think the first question, why this book and why now? So thank you so much for having me. Uh, and if you did actually want to spend the whole hour talking about how good the book is, that would actually be totally fine with me. Just, you know, for the record. Uh, so again, thank you for having me. Hi, listeners. Uh, this book came about uh, on the heels of my last book, Artificial Unintelligence, How Computers Misunderstand the World. And after uh, Artificial Unintelligence came out, I found myself having a lot of conversations with different audiences all over the world. And the topic that we kept coming back to was the intersection of technology and race. And we also talked a lot about the intersection of technology and gender. And I started thinking more about the intersection of technology and disability. And I realized that I had all of these things to say about the intersection of these three things and technology. And I I wanted to explore them in a longer format. So here we are 
Uh, the new book is called More Than a Glitch, Confronting Race, Gender, and Ability Bias in Tech. And speaking of that title, let's cover the first half, More Than a Glitch. I'm curious what you meant by glitch when you titled the book with this word and um, how it relates to the world of, of tech ethics and responsible technology. Well, a glitch implies something ephemeral, right? A glitch is something that is a blip, it's momentary, it is easily fixed in the code. Uh, whereas a bug is something that is more kind of more intense. A glitch is something that you think, oh, we'll just fix that. That's not a big deal. Whereas a bug is a problem. And what I felt was that people tend to treat a uh, bias inside technical systems as a glitch. So when we have a case like Google Images labeling uh, photos of Black men as gorillas, uh, that gets treated like a glitch. Oh yeah, something will just fix in the code that's you know that's not a big deal or when uh microsoft bought tay i uh, started spewing anti-semitic rhetoric on twitter or when chat gbt does something like uh generate tax that seems like it's grooming a teenager for a child predator i uh, these things get treated like oh yeah, that was totally unexpected, but actually there's no problem. We'll just fix it. And I'm arguing that actually we are at a point when we should be more sophisticated in our understanding of technology and our understanding of the way that social problems manifest inside technology. And so I urge readers to use a frame that was given to us by Ruha Benjamin and her book, Race After Technology. And that's the idea that technology and automated systems discriminate by default. One thing that's coming to mind for me, as you're mentioning chat GPT specifically, is uh, last month we talked with Emily Bender and Casey Fiesler. And one thing that Casey mentioned is the magic that gets seen basically gets read into chat GPT like oh we have this tool oh my god it's like this thing that we, we know how it works we don't know how it works and it's just like it's really cool and we can just dive into it and use it and one of the examples towards the end of your book you gave was your computer science teacher I think maybe back in undergrad talking about the magic of uh, of technology the magic of coding and it it is neat right it's like all this technology even like the the glitches are kind of this this weird magic. And I'm curious for you in thinking about this framing of maybe how we get away from that framing of magic to see technology more of, of how it is um, in producing injustices, etc. I mean, I would really love to see the uh, the rhetoric around technology equals magic. Like, I would love to see that disappear uh, because it is really a distraction. Uh, when people uh, think about themselves as magic because they're making technology or they think of themselves as wizards, uh, it contributes to kind of an inflated uh, sense of one's own power when it comes to technology. Uh, and I think we need to add nuance to that. We need to understand that uh, our black boxes of automated systems are not actually impenetrable, uh, but they can be understood, but it takes a fair bit of computational literacy to do that. Uh, so one of the things I'm really invested in is empowering people around complex technical topics so that people can push back when algorithmic systems are making decisions that are unfair. Uh, in the book, I tell the story about uh, a time when I was an undergraduate and I was really struggling to understand something in my computer science class. Uh, and the professor got really frustrated with me and said, okay, listen, just pretend it's magic. Like, just, just do it, just do the thing that I said and you don't have to understand why just pretend it's magic and it'll work and so i did and you know 
it did work because like it's a pretty mundane technical concept i uh, but i felt really dismissed in that moment and i could tell that the professor just wanted to get rid of me he wasn't i uh, invested in me learning a thing uh that definitely happens but it, it's not it's not ideal it's interesting hearing you say this, you're reminding me of when I was first getting into the discipline of what we'll keep calling tech ethics, I guess, today. Um, there is this concept called the engineering mindset, where an engineer is taught to ask the question, how? How do we build this? How do we create these technologies? And the philosopher instead is taught to ask why? Why do we create these technologies and what is the impact? And that was something that I was grappling with as like a budding computer scientist at the time was, oh my gosh, I'm being taught how to do all these things, but I'm never being taught how to ask why, why are we are doing these things? And I'm curious from your perspective, because one of the things that I loved so much about this book, as you were just saying, uh, is just the, the, um, the writing style that you chose was really catered to any kind of audience of any technical background. And I find that so refreshing in this space because I, for some reason, technologists have this stereotype of like, oh, we've learned these uh, really complex technologies and now we have to like gatekeep so that only those who have put in the work to learn how these technologies work are allowed to be in, invited into the conversation. And I'm just curious what you think the role of like critical algorithmic literacy plays in and um, gatekeeping plays in our ability to ask these questions of why and to critically interrogate our technologies. I'm so glad you brought this up because uh, there's so much gatekeeping in tech. Uh, I remember that when I was uh, when I was a budding technologist, when I was just learning, I was always made to feel small and I was always made to feel stupid for not understanding something. And nobody ever said to me, hey, well, listen, this stuff is actually hard to understand. And so just keep at it. You're doing fine. Like just keep hammering at it. I, uh, which would have been a more helpful thing than just making me feel dumb because, you know, everybody learns at their own pace and this, uh, you know, technical stuff is not impossible. Uh, it's just a little challenging. Uh, and the, the normative, ethic inside tech is also uh, is definitely worth examining. Uh, I wrote about this a little bit in Artificial and Intelligence, and I continued in more than a glitch with this idea of techno chauvinism, which is a kind of bias toward technical solutions. Uh, and the idea that you would go into a meeting at any big tech company and say like, oh yeah, I think we should do this without technology. Like, I think there's a better solution that doesn't involve building a computer program. Like nobody would do that, right? Uh, you don't walk into an engineering school and point out that, oh, hey, I, if we are trying to get books to kids in, or if we're trying to get learning materials to kids in rural areas, like maybe it's not a good idea to like give everybody iPads and eBooks, uh, because there's no connectivity, like maybe it's a better idea to do paper books, right? So techno chauvinism can get in the way of good decision making. Uh, what I argue instead is that we should use the right tool for the task. And sometimes the right tool for the task is a computer. And sometimes it's something simple, like a book in the hands of a child sitting on its parents lap, right? One is not inherently better than the other. Um, but you're right, we do get trained in things like the engineering mindset, uh, or there's another aesthetic that I write about a little bit called uh, elegant code. So back in the day, uh, computer programs had to be really small because memory was really expensive and computing was really expensive. And so you would refactor your computer programs down to the smallest, most elegant unit. And that is the dominant aesthetic still. Um, I mean, if I look at code and it just sprawls all over the place, I'm like, oh yeah, that's not that's not elegant. Like that is 100% the way I was trained. Uh, and 
So this kind of mindset leads to making some default decisions that are not necessarily in harmony with the way that society operates now. So a good example of this is the case of gender. Uh, when I was taught to write elegant code, I was taught that uh, there were only two genders, male and female, and they should be represented as zero or one, as binary values. Now, we know now, you know, uh, this is, we're now several decades past when I learned to code, and we know now that gender is a spectrum, uh, but programmers are often still representing gender as just a binary. Uh, and instead, what we should be doing now is should, we should be making gender an editable field. We should make it something that the user can change by themselves without talking to customer service. We shouldn't represent it as a binary. We should represent it as text. Uh, maybe there's a drop down. Maybe it's free text entry. Uh, there are politics to these kinds of seemingly mundane technical decisions. I think we'll get into some more case studies uh, for techno chauvinism and dive even more into that term in a second. But one thing I'm reflecting on right now and also in reading the book was how much of your own story that you told, of how much there were a lot of I statements and really pushing, I guess, a, a narrative or telling a narrative, I should say. Um, and I'm curious about that decision for you writing that book and almost the, the power of storytelling maybe for that computer, computational literacy or uh, yeah, just to talk more about weaving your own story within the book during the process of writing. So glad you asked. Uh, I don't usually get asked about this. So it's thrilling to talk about, uh, like to talk about narrative craft. Uh, so I, I do this a lot. Uh, I write a lot in first person when I am writing about complex technical topics. Uh, and I do that for a couple of reasons. It comes out of a literary tradition called immersion journalism, uh, which is a kind of descendant of uh, ethnography, uh, where the ethnographer is a participant observer, right? They're participating in a scene and then they're also observing it and writing about it. Immersion journalists do this and uh, immerse themselves fully in a situation. Uh, and what I do often is I build technology in order to uh, explore a phenomenon and I take readers along on that journey. Uh, and there are some practical reasons for doing this. Uh, if I were to just write about the technology without any people in it, it would be really boring, right? So we we kind of want to see people. We want to see characters moving around uh, in uh, you know in engaging nonfiction. Uh, and so I put myself in because you know. I'm there. I'm a convenient, <laughs> convenient character. Uh, and I am building the thing. Uh, so one of the stories that I tell in the book is uh, I talk about uh, when I took my own mammograms and ran them through an open source uh, cancer detection AI in order to write about the state of the art in AI based cancer detection. And you just perfectly segued into what my next question was going to be, which was to um, ask for a, let's say, maybe sneak peek into what that story was and maybe how techno chauvinism um, proliferated in, in the medical industry and the techno industrial medicine complex, we can call it. Um, especially as it related to your your personal experience and your attempts to like gain access to data that maybe should have rightfully been yours, for example. Well, this whole this whole thing started when I got a mammogram. Uh, you know, routine medical care. Everybody get your mammogram if it's uh, you know if it's appropriate and you know, appropriate for your age and what have you. Uh, and I saw on the scan a note that said this scan was read by an AI. And I thought, oh, that's weird. Like, I wonder what the AI saw. Uh, and then I kind of forgot about it a little bit because I got diagnosed with breast cancer and that was terrible. And, uh, you know, I went through uh, the whole 
treatment and I am now fine. So I should preface it with that. I am fine. Uh, I received excellent medical care. I'm really grateful to all the doctors and nurses and medical staff who took care of me. Uh, but I couldn't forget this, this note on the chart. And so I decided to investigate why the AI had read my scans, what it saw, and what was the state of the art in AI-based cancer detection. Uh, we tend to hear about AI in cancer as being right around the corner. Uh, there was an article in the New York Times recently about how uh, people were using AI in Hungary on breast cancer and reading the article, you got the impression that this was going to be happening everywhere like next week. And it turns out the truth is way more complicated than that. I, I looked at some open source software because one of the ways you can understand proprietary software is by looking at open source software because it's, you know, kind of made, it's all made the same way, right? Same general principles apply. Uh, and when you're looking at an algorithmic system in general, uh, we know from algorithmic accountability reporting, which is kind of journalism that I do, uh, we know that uh, you can understand an algorithmic system by looking at the training data and looking at the outputs and also reading a, the reading the documentation uh, and reading the academic research about how the system is built. Uh, so I did this. Um, I looked at some open source software. I looked at the training data. Uh, and then I tried to get a hold of my own mammograms in order to uh, run them through. And I thought this was going to be easy because we have electronic medical records and, you know, people make a big deal about how portable data is. And it was not portable and it was not easy. So this is one of the reasons that I'm a little skeptical when people claim that, uh, that there is like a bright AI enabled future for medical data around the corner. Um, these systems are clunky and are not necessarily interoperable and they're very, very fragile, right? So I eventually got the data. I ran my scans through uh, the uh, the cancer detection AI. It's made by one of my colleagues at NYU and it worked. It was really cool. Uh, it identified uh, what I knew was a cancerous area, but I realized that it didn't work the way I expected. So I expected that it would be some kind of Grey's Anatomy type scenario, right? Like I, I do write a lot about how our, our Hollywood ideas about AI are really deeply embedded. And, you know, I myself have really trained myself not to think about the Terminator when I think about AI, but it turns out that I think about Grey's Anatomy when I think about uh, medical technology. And so I expected this moment to be like a really big reveal and I expected it to be dramatic. And I thought there would, I don't know, I just thought it would be visually exciting. And it's really not. Like, I just like took a flat image and ran it through the program. And then it drew a red box. And that was it. So I had unreasonable expectations about the cancer detection system. And I realized, oh, wait, like this is an unreasonable expectation that I got from uh you know, from reading about the promise of AI in the popular press. So I think we need to dial it back. I think we need to be more realistic about what AI, AI can and can't do when it comes to cancer. It is primarily a tool that may or may not help doctors. Uh, and it is more in its infancy than you might expect from the marketing literature that's out there. Uh, that said, uh, I'm very impressed with a lot of the uh, with a lot of the research being done in this area, uh, and the research that I looked at specifically uh, was a really good example of being uh, being honest about what works well and what doesn't. Yeah, it's it's interesting. One of the things that uh, really stood out to me when you were sharing this story in the book towards the end after you, you got these results back and you were looking at that image in the red box 
was um, the numbers that were associated with the box. And you describe in the book, you get this um, like decimal, like point to something. And you were expecting that to be a percentage of like likelihood that this was a uh, like malignant tumor, for example. And um, and then this conversation is sort of started around like, well, why wasn't it, it a percentage likelihood? Why was it just this like arbitrary decimal that I and now as the end user am supposed to interpret? And I think this is really a great opportunity to open us up to a conversation around um, like what outputs of these really high risk models should be if if engineers, computer scientists who are creating these technologies should have the responsibility to to um, make declarative statements with the outputs of their models, or if interpretation should always be left to the end users. And this could be like high stakes, like medicine, or we could be talking about things like, you know, fairness and, and quant quantifying other really high risk, um, theoretical sticky subjects. What do you think the role of, where do you think the role of responsibility lies in interpreting the outputs of these kinds of models? You know, I think, I'm reluctant to make a sweeping statement about it. Like, I think I'm reluctant to say it should always be this or that, because I think it depends on context. Uh, with most of AI, I think it depends on the context. Uh, so when I got the uh, the results of this uh, of this AI analysis that I did on my own scans, as I said, it drew a red box and it gave me a uh, it gave me this score. Uh, and because it was a numerical score and because, you know, it had uh, a decimal point in it, I immediately assumed, oh yeah, this is a percentage. Like this is a 20% chance that this is, uh, that this is a malignant area that's been identified. And like, this was another case where I was wrong. Like, so the way that I was wrong was extremely instructive. Uh, we have a lot of misconceptions about how AI works. Uh, and I was really interested to discover that this is uh, because of legal issues, right? So the AI can't output a prediction that, oh, there's a 20% chance that this is malignant. Uh, because of the legal environment in which it operates. So that led me down a uh, a rabbit hole of kind of trying to understand the uh, the legal and economic environment for AI in hospitals. Uh, so something else interesting is that we we do hear a lot about, AI replacing radiologists, which is not something that I think is going to happen anytime soon, uh, but you do hear it. Uh, and people often talk about how AI diagnosis is going to be so much faster and so much cheaper, but hospitals don't get paid if an AI reads a scan and hospitals do get paid if a radiologist reads a scan. So there are these competing economic incentives that I definitely was not aware of until this project. And I I think we're going to have to start having conversations that are also about like who's getting paid, who wins, who profits uh, from AI in medicine. And what does this do to like the economic models that make healthcare effective? Outside of the healthcare sector, you also cover several other topics. Um, and I think the way I want to frame this is in terms of the, the Hollywood idea that you referenced and like the stories that we tell about, or that, you know, depends on who the we is, <laughs> but we'll use Hollywood for as an example, um, that Hollywood tells about, about AI. And I'm curious what we're looking at uh, either race or gender or ability bias, other ways that you're seeing that Hollywood idea play out in technology design and maybe how you're seeing ways that we can combat that or right-size that to the reality that we're actually living through. I think that Hollywood is our default uh, in part because Hollywood stories are so well told, right? We feel like 
uh, the Star Wars universe, for example, is real. We feel like it exists. And you can go down to Florida or over to California and actually like spend time pretending that you're living in it at Disney World. Like it's it's very vivid. Right. Uh, so we need to uh, make sure to operate in the world of what's real when we're thinking about AI. And we need to not get it confused with science fiction. Uh, there has been for a very long time, like a, a kind of longstanding initiative to make science fiction real. Uh, and, you know, you see this in people who want to go live on other planets or people who want to make uh, ray guns or want to make teleportation devices, uh, which are all incredibly fun to think about. And I completely applaud the creativity of, you know, of wanting to make imaginary stuff real. But I think that we are at a point, technologically speaking, when we need to be practical about these things as well. And we need to reflect not just on, can we do something? Can we build it? But should we build it? Uh, so I am really delighted that there is a greater conversation happening in corporate America about AI ethics. And uh, there is a conversation about responsible AI governance happening. Uh, one of the things I read about in the book is uh, Salesforce, uh, which has a, an AI ethicist named Kathy Baxter on staff. And Kathy Baxter has done this diagram that shows exactly where uh, a bias audit can exist inside an existing corporate process, right? So one of the excuses people often make when they're building technology is, oh, we don't, uh, we don't really have time to audit this technology for bias. Uh, and what that actually means is we don't want to do it. Uh, but if you integrate it into your regular business processes, uh, there's plenty of time to do it. And if you start looking, you're going to find problems, right? Technology is biased. Technology includes the unconscious biases of its creators, right? This has been an open secret for a really long time but it's the open secret that I explore in the book. And we really just, we need to talk about it. We need to not be afraid of talking about it uh, because confronting it is really the only way that we're going to make any kind of progress. And it's going to be a tough conversation. Uh, those tough conversations will have to happen over and over again. It's going to require collective solutions. It's going to require a lot of kindness. Uh, and you know, I hope, like, I hope we're up to the challenge. One thing that I think we see in different contexts is that bias as a word has some linguistic slippage of people mean different things in different spaces. And the same thing with fairness. I'm stepping on Jess's toes a little bit as the person who studies fairness <laughs> as, as, a, as, a, as a scholar. I do something very different. Um, but um, I'm curious for you, because I know you have a whole chapter in this book also about bias. Um, in uh, a machine bias, understanding machine bias. And I'm wondering for you, how you understand bias and perhaps fairness and whether it's that kind of the two sides of the, the same coin or whether those are two totally different concepts. It's a good question. I'm gonna go back to the idea of context. I, I write in the book about fairness and bias in the context of technological systems. And I also tell a story about the difference between mathematical fairness and social fairness. Uh, and one of the ways I understand the dis distinction is by thinking about a cookie. So when I was a kid uh, and there would be one cookie left in the kitchen, my brother and I would fight over who got the cookie. And uh, my brother is younger than I am. And so I, you know, there would just, well, there was just fighting. <laughs> so if you were a computer and you were confronted with this as a word problem, you know, two children, one cookie, uh, the computer would say, oh, well, you cut the cookie in half, each child gets 50% and that solves the problem. And that is absolutely true. That is a mathematically fair way to solve the problem. 
But in the real world, when you break a cookie in half, there's a big half and a little half. And so if I wanted the big half, I would say to my brother, all right, you give me the big half now and I will let you uh, pick the TV show that we watch after dinner. And my brother would think for a second, he would say, oh yeah, that sounds fair. And it was, it was a socially fair decision. And so I think when we are talking about using technology to solve problems, we need to be clear about are we looking for a mathematically fair solution or are we looking for a socially fair solution? And if we're looking for something that's socially fair, I we should really be cautious about using computational systems for this because computers can only calculate mathematical fairness, right? So computers are not the best tool for solving social problems alone, right? We're not going to be able to code our way out of social problems. Computers can be a really good uh, tool for humans to use, but we shouldn't expect that we transfer decision-making over to autonomous computational systems, and that will somehow be better than, you know, than human problem solving. Totally agreed. And it's interesting too, in some of the research that I've done on algorithmic fairness, it it seems like a lot of, um, I'll just say like computer scientists as a broad generalization, but the people who, who love to audit systems for fairness mathematically, um, more recently have begun to attempt auditing these systems for like social fairness, for example. But it, it is sort of, there is this question of like, is it possible to even audit a system for something that is, you know, non-empirical, non-observable, not, not quantifiable, but perhaps not reducible to a number? Um, and so I'm, I'm just curious about this, this topic of auditing generally. And you mentioned earlier that one of the things that you do in your work is this algorithmic accountability reporting. And I'm curious if, if you could just um, perhaps describe to us what that is and how that influences your work. So algorithmic, uh, algorithmic auditing is, I think, just one of the most exciting, uh, exciting new fields in computer science. Uh, it is I mean, I I am just I am thrilled that it exists, uh, and I I love seeing uh, all of the amazing projects that have uh, that have bloomed in the past couple of years. Uh, so let me back up. So algorithmic accountability reporting uh, is a is a subtype of data journalism. Uh, in today's world, algorithms are increasingly being used to make decisions on our behalf. Uh, and one of the traditional functions of the press is to hold uh, decision makers accountable. So in the modern world, the accountability function of the press transfers onto algorithms and their makers. So we have algorithmic accountability reporting, holding algorithms and their makers accountable. Uh, sometimes that means uh, opening up the black box of an algorithm and uh, examining what's going on. So the journalistic project that kicked this all off is a project called Machine Bias by Julia Angwin, uh, formerly of uh, ProPublica, formerly of The Markup. Uh, and what that investigation found was that there was software used across the country um, to estimate the risk of recidivism. Uh, the risk of reoffending, and the software was biased against Black people. Uh, ProPublica released the uh, released the data that they used to evaluate the system, and it caused an absolute flourishing of interest in the topic. It facilitated uh, our new understanding of mathematical dimension dimensions of fairness. Uh, and one of the interesting findings uh, was a mathematician computer scientist uh, went in and discovered that, oh, there's actually no way for this algorithm to be uh, to be fair to both white people and black people. Right. So this was uh, kind of what kicked off algorithmic accountability reporting. Uh, recently, there have been uh, some really amazing investigations that came out 
Uh, there was one from the markup about uh, an algorithm used in LA to uh, allocate uh, homes to people who are unhoused. Uh, and they found, uh, found, I believe it was racial bias inside that algorithm. Uh, there was a story that came out in Wired recently uh, in collaboration with Lighthouse Reports about an algorithm used in the city of Rotterdam to allegedly detect welfare fraud. Well, this was biased uh, based on ethnicity and gender. Uh, there's another AP investigation of an algorithm uh, used in, uh, what is it? It's in like child, child safety something. Should fact check me on that. Uh, AP investigation uh, looking at an algorithm used in uh, providing some kind of public service that they found bias in. I, so it's great that there are all these investigations happening uh, because it's, you know, bringing clarity to unfair systems. I would really prefer if the unfair systems didn't exist in the first place, uh, but I'm glad that as reporters, we have tools to do this. Uh, and so sometimes algorithmic accountability reporters open up black boxes. Sometimes what we do is we write our own code in order to investigate things. I, 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 I do this sometimes. Um, there is a Wall Street Journal investigation about the TikTok algorithm. Uh, that's another example of this, where they uh, they built a lot of bots and had the bots, uh, quote unquote, watch TikTok videos in order to understand how the TikTok algorithm works. And then they you know, did this terrific explainer about how the TikTok algorithm works, right? So uh, sometimes we investigate other people's code, sometimes we write our own code. Uh, and it is very much related to uh, algorithmic auditing. So algorithmic auditing comes from the world of compliance, which if your eyes are starting to glaze over at this point, like that is that is not unusual. Uh, people never want to talk about compliance. Uh, I totally understand, but it's actually sort of interesting. Uh, so the idea behind algorithmic auditing is that we can take the inputs and the outputs of the system uh, we can look at the model, we can look at the code, and we can uh, apply, you know, common sense reasoning or, uh, you know, definitions of mathematical fairness, and we can evaluate uh, whether the system is biased against different groups, uh, if so, how much, and, uh, and does it matter? Right. So we have lots of tools for this now. There's something new from Mozilla uh, that Deb Raji has put out. It's called uh, OAT, the Open Access Toolkit for Algorithmic Auditing. Uh, there's something that came out from IBM a few years ago called uh, FAIR 360. Uh, and there are lots of other uh, open, source, uh, open source toolkits for auditing systems. We have a lot of folks who listen to the show who are researchers in the academic space, in the industry space, a lot of students as well who are on board, right? They're on board with what, they're, what you're saying and they're thinking, you know, well, how do I do the work in order to like operationalize this in a research capacity? So for example, myself, I do a lot of work with oncology and end of life planning and I use a lot of ethnography in order to say, okay, well, technology, how can technology be effective? How can it not be effective? And then what, what are the social needs of people in addition to the tech needs? And I'm still thinking like, well, these like, chart notes from the 90s on this like 90s interface, right? I want to do something about it. I want to make some sort of implementation um, in terms of fairness, in terms of bias, but also in terms of like interface access. But I want to do really effective research to do that. And I think one thing that your book speaks to is it, whether it's algorithmic auditing or other examples you give are 
really powerful and effective interdisciplinary research opportunities for like the methods of actually doing this work in the first place. And I was wondering if you were to speak to the, the researchers out there who are listening, um, how do you do this work well? How do you research these topics well? Or maybe what success have you found or, or failures, <laughs> depending on how you want to frame it um, in doing this work? I'm so glad you asked that. Uh, and one of the challenges for me as a researcher has been that uh, there isn't a kind of defined set of methodologies for doing interdisciplinary digital work, right? So uh, as a journalist and as a uh, as someone who writes uh, scholarly work uh, in communication journals uh, and as someone who does just very interdisciplinary stuff, like I tend to... Uh, to pick and choose my methodologies from whatever discipline has one that works for me. Uh, I have the freedom to do that. I don't think that every researcher has the freedom to do that because some disciplines are really orthodox about what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. Uh, so I... I think that we are we are overdue for a uh, kind of lots and lots of uh, methodology uh, methodology papers about uh, complex digital research. Uh, one of the resources I would point people to uh, is something I'm involved in called the Center for Critical Race and Digital Studies. Uh, and there's a CRDS syllabus that is uh, really, really uh, wide ranging uh, and has a lot of work from ethnography of Black Twitter to uh, how do we, uh, you know, how do we collect, uh, you know, beauty tutorials and use them to understand uh you know, to understand cultural identity. Uh, so I would say definitely check out the work of uh, of CRDS scholars. Um, and I have a question for you actually, which is uh, what are some examples of really good use of technology in end of life situations? Well, you're asking the dissertation question, um, and I'm, I'm probably going to defer a little bit. Um, I think we're still trying to figure it out. And so um, my work is basically how do we create a tool as we create more and more data um, every year in our lives, and we have so much that we leave behind to our loved ones after we die. Um, and technology, say Silicon Valley, et cetera, are not particularly known for developing for end-of-life needs and end-of-life technology for various reasons. Um, how do we design tools that help people first think about it and reflect on what their data is going to be, and then also what their wishes are, and then how to communicate that to technology and to systems that will actually make those wishes um, executable or able to be fulfilled after death. Um, and so there's there's many other <laughs> many other topics that I don't want to take away from the, uh, this particular conversation. Um, That's super interesting because yeah. <laughs> um, I definitely would not have thought about that. Like I I immediately flash to uh, things like CareBridge or Meal Train, which I think are uh, are really really useful for the uh, the kind of practical aspects of end of life situations because uh you do want to you know to, to take a meal over to somebody who is you know who's dealing with that and meal train helps you organize it so you don't have like a thousand casseroles showing up one day and then nothing you know the next five days and carebridge it seems like is uh, or systems like that seem really useful for uh keeping the community aware of what's going on with uh with somebody who's in medical crisis without having to burden the caregivers with like sending a million emails and texts and photos and what have you um so that's interesting that's something i'll think about thank you i think something else that you just highlighted in that response to was just how complex 
these technologies are when we attempt to interact between technology and a social system or when we attempt to solve, I'm going to use air quotes here, to solve <laughs> social problems with technological systems, we, we learn time and time again that these things cannot be solved purely through technological means, if through any technological means at all. And I think we so often hear this really like negative dystopic rhetoric, at least in the like AI ethics academic world, um, that's sort of just like burn it all down, don't make it in the first place. And um, I really appreciate it at the end of your book that you you end with this perspective of hope and the things that you're hopeful for in this discipline um, and surrounding all these themes. So I'm going to ask that question to you now. Um, in, in this techno chauvinist world that we find ourselves embedded in, what is something that you are currently hopeful about? Well, I am really hopeful uh, that researchers like you are going to help us get more insight into fairness uh, and uh, and help us figure out what the heck is going on. Uh, so that's one thing I'm optimistic about. Uh, another thing I'm optimistic about is uh, the field of public interest technology, uh, which is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, it's making technology in the public interest. And so sometimes that means uh, working on a government website to strengthen it so it doesn't go down when uh, there's a pandemic and a million people file for unemployment insurance simultaneously. Uh, sometimes public interest technology means doing algorithmic accountability reporting uh, and uncovering systems that are uh, racially biased or uh, ableist or gender biased or just unjust in some way. I, I am very hopeful that I, there are going to be more jobs in this sector going forward. I, one of the things that we did at the NYU Alliance for Public Interest Technology, uh, which is a group I'm part of, uh, is we sponsored a career fair uh, with All Tech is Human, uh, where we brought together people who are uh, offering jobs in the sector and uh, all of that material is recorded and archived so students can learn more about job opportunities in that field. Uh, and I am really, uh, I'm really hopeful uh, based on what I'm seeing in the classroom. Uh, my students are just terrific. Uh, they really understand these issues and they are interested in uh, in building technology that uh, is that is not biased or that is not racist, that is not sexist, that is not ableist, uh, and they're really interested in pushing to build technology to make it better. Well, uh, Meredith, unfortunately, I think we are at time for this conversation, but thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It was such a pleasure. And of course, in the show notes and all of the different links, we'll make sure uh, that you listeners have all the resources that you need, both from this conversation and also to buy the book, underlining that the book is so amazing. Go buy it now. We want to thank Meredith again for joining us today for this wonderful conversation. And as always, now is the time where we debrief our immediate reactions after the conversation. So Dylan, what is immediately coming up for you right now? Yeah, it's just exciting to have Meredith on the show. Um, I don't think we mentioned this in the intro, but years ago we had Meredith on the show as part of a, a collaboration with All Tech is Human, um, and it was really cool for uh, us to now be the ones um, interviewing her and being able to chat and, and get to know her better and everything. So it's kind of a, a full circle, like three years later um, kind of thing that was, that was really cool. I think the thing I'm still stuck with um, as uh, I guess a, a researcher who cares about these things and is thinking about how to frame them in new ways. So thinking about say fairness and bias and tech, uh, responsible technology and how we tell the story or stories of our research without replicating the Hollywood narratives, right? With, without replicating the um, 
high-flying techno chauvinism that has gotten us into this mess in the first place. And one thing that I asked Meredith about and that I just think a lot about is, well, what are the stories that we're telling about ourselves as researchers? Do we even tell our stories within our papers uh, or our books or whatever? Do we treat technology as the subjective thing that's over there or do we name our identity? And then what are the ramifications of naming our identity? Um, do we get targeted for it? I'm curious about the stories that you know other researchers tell about researchers who disclose their identity or their positionality. Um, Meredith brings up you know standpoint theory, which has a, a history in in feminism and disclosure of identity and and how you can use that to upend power structures. And so I'm curious as technologists or as people researchers or people building tools, how we can leverage personal storytelling effectively uh, and not in ways that just replicate existing systems of, of power and systems of oppression. So that's what I'm sitting with. Mm. Um, wow. <laughs> just that? <laughs> just just only, only that. Um, just what are, I know we, we, we come at this from, from very different um, backgrounds, and I'm wondering, yeah, what, what's on your mind? Yeah. It's so funny. After these interviews happen, um, especially usually like while we're debriefing, I'll like think of new questions and new thoughts, and I'm like, oh, I should have asked that during the interview. Dang it. I want to know Meredith's take on this. But um, I just had one of those moments while you were speaking where I, I was thinking about, you know, her narrative during the book and um, just some of the different stories that she tells. And I I noticed that there was this sort of like duality that was emerging in the book where on the one hand, it's like we shouldn't be building some of these systems in the first place. Like technology does not have a place or should not have a place um, or should not have a seat at the table in some disciplines, some domains, some circumstances. And then on the other hand, we have the, this narrative of like, okay, well, these technologies in some cases have already been made. Or sometimes there's nothing we can do to stop these people from making them, unfortunately. Like that's just sort of the reality that we live in. And so in the event that these technologies are made, how can we effectively improve them? How can we effectively audit them? How can we evaluate them? And so that's sort of the, the tension that I'm grappling with right now. And what I would love to know how Meredith thinks about this. Maybe we can get her take on this and then share it in a future episode or something. But I, I'm just I'm wondering, like, to what extent should, um, you know, academics like us, researchers like us or even, you know, the 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 casual technology user, to what extent should we be working within the system that we've been placed in? And to what extent should we be like fighting to take that system down? And it sort of speaks to like the the topic and the theme of, of this show too, right? Like this this idea of like radical technology is to really like to 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 question technology at its root and to 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 critically question the systems that we've been placed in and, and perhaps to try to um, to shift them and to fundamentally change them before they have the chance to even cause harm. Yeah, one thing that you said, uh, one question that you asked, or part of a question that you asked was about re reducing the social systems to a technological perspective. And um, Meredith put me on the spot. It's, you know, at, towards the end of the interview about like, well, well, what is it that you study and, what, and what's coming out of that research, um, which which I kind of freaked on. But I... Um, <laughs> Nobody ever asks us I, questions. We're never I know. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> is this what it feels like to be on the other side? Um, but... Uh, but that's a, that's a question that I ask a lot about this death thing of what, like, if technology isn't designed for that social thing at all right now and is now playing catch up to what, like, thousands of years, the entire human history of, like, ritual that's been built up and whatever, that, like, what do, what can technology do at the end of life? Is it just logistical? What does it play in, in culture and in rit yeah, ritual broadly, religion, all these kind of questions come up that technology just maybe shouldn't be a part of, maybe should, and now it like there's no choice <laughs> but for it to be, and so what do we do? Um, and so I think that's the other question for me is like, well, for stuff like death or uh, probably a lot of other topics that there aren't social solutions necessarily, maybe it's just like harm reduction or something um, for the techno chauvinism, like what is, yeah, what, what, are, the, what are the possibilities? Um, and over the three years of the show, I think we kind of, I remember like three episodes in asking the same question. So I guess we're, 
I guess we're we're evolving but staying the same. <laughs> yeah, right. Much, much like technology, possibly. Much I don't know. like anyway. technology. <laughs> no, it is interesting though. I mean, I I think like the the language of solutions in the tech ethics space is always so fascinating to me. Like how do you even grapple with trying to come up with a solution to something that is potentially inherently unsolvable? And the concept of coming up with a solution is just like so subjective and theoretical too. Like how do you even know that you've solved something? Well, maybe you've achieved an arbitrary metric that someone set. Is that metric all encompassing and holistically like representing the thing that we were attempting to solve in the first place? Does solution mean that everyone is happy with the outcome? Does solution mean that something that was broken is now fixed? How can you tell if it's fixed? And it gets even more complex when we're talking about like social issues where people disagree on basically everything that I just said. And so you might have some people who are like, yes, this is fixed. I got the bigger half of the cookie, as Meredith was saying. And other people who are like, hey, I got the smaller half of the cookie. No, this is not fixed. I'm not okay with this. And I just get so excited talking about these topics. They're so fascinating to me. That's probably a good thing, which is why I research algorithmic fairness work, because you know there are no solutions. And and the whole concept of doing practical ethics work is, is working within the constraints of a system where you know that there is no no right and wrong. There is no um, good or bad. There's maybe better or worse. But even that is something that's so subjective that, that it's just it's such a complex space and such a really like rich research opportunity to really start to like interrogate what do we even mean by solutions? What do we even mean by fair? What do we even mean by unbiased? And um, and I think that that's probably why we will continue asking these same questions in however many years it is as we continue to run this podcast. I don't think we'll ever stop. <laughs> well, and, and I, I think Meredith are uh, some, some of those uh, co-conspirators, right, is one of those co-conspirators with us of, <laughs> of asking those questions. And so it's fitting that we're ending with more questions. <laughs> I guess we always have more <laughs> questions than answers, but maybe maybe that's our job in this. I'm not sure. Um, I, um, I, 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 again, just want to, um, we want to thank Meredith for coming on uh, the show today. Please do read her book. Um, we know that over the last episode with Casey Fiesler and Emily Bender, and also this episode, uh, we I guess we imagine for this episode, we'll have a lot of new listeners. And so per Jess's plug at the beginning of this episode, please do, in order to find more information, please visit the episode page at radicalai.org. And and uh, besides the awesome discount that you can get from buying this book if you do visit the episode page for this episode, if you enjoyed this episode, we invite you to subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes or your favorite podcatcher. You can catch our regularly scheduled episodes the last Wednesday of every month, unless we have something really exciting come out, like a book launch, which is what happened this time. So this is the second to last Wednesday of this month that we're releasing this episode. And you can join our conversation on Twitter at Radical. AI pod. You can join our conversation on LinkedIn at the Radical AI podcast. And as always, stay radical. Mm-hmm.